Blitz is defined as a sudden, savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic, primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. None except. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> man. I back it up. And we are chock full of that, man. That's right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold said so. If you're going to blitz, come strong, but don't come at all. We are coming strong because, gentlemen, it is my favorite week. Of the year, <laughs> it's OU week. Cotton Bowl on Saturday. Got a two thirty kick. Haven't had a two thirty kick since two thousand ten. Been a while. But uh, you know, Rod, Rod, are you going to Dallas this year? I'm not going this year. Okay, it's actually, first time I'm going, not going in a long time. Because I was going to say, if you were going this year, there would be no need to sleep in the McDonald's parking lot. You could this actually go to the yes. hotel, yeah, and, and get you a few hours, yeah. and then go to the fair. Get up at a reasonable time. Yeah. That's right. I don't have to worry about the uh, the crackhead. Uh, I remember that hangs out and tries to. <laughs> I don't know if he's a parking attendant or if he's hustling me, but he's a crackhead. As, there as all we the time. discussed, though, oh, I've had great interactions with those. <laughs> yeah. As we discussed, though, the crackhead will watch your car. He will take care of your car. He will, and for very cheap, actually, yeah. considering. Or just, like just forty bucks or something. <laughs> it's how much it cost me last time, but I had to get there at the last second. Yeah, that must be. You see, that's that's your problem, man. You got there late. Yeah, yep. it's right behind it, McDonald's. Well, see, if I, charge, it's charging you that convenience fee. If yeah. I would have actually <laughs> slept in my car the night before, I wouldn't have been late because I had left the tickets for that game in the wrong car. It was in the other car. Oh, man. So I regretted see? actually not sleeping in the car. Would have been there in plenty of time and then wouldn't have had to pay the extra 10 minute before kickoff price, but I, they, I mean, you have no options. It's one of my it's one of my traditions to sleep in my car right before Texas OU, and for the first time one in like my six t- years, I'm not doing it. I'm sad. Well, Rod, you can <laughs> Hopefully sleep. you aren't. That'd be funny <laughs> if you were somehow sleeping in your car still. <laughs> this is actually the first time in a while that, like, the three of us as a group, I know we don't get to, like, hang out during the game or the week, but, like, the three of us actually all won't be up there. I'll be up there, but, Matt, you just said you're not going, and nope. Rod yeah. just found out you're not going. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. But at any rate, we're going to talk about the win over K-State and talk plenty about Texas OU. This is Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. I am Jeff Howe. Let me bring in the rest of the team for those unfamiliar. Those of you who are familiar with the show, thank you so much for downloading and listening. We do appreciate it. Those of you unfamiliar, here is the team. He is the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire, the man behind the glass no longer. He is now the man uh, sitting. uh, There's a computer monitor blocking our interactions right now. But there we go. Hello. Matt Butler, what's up? Open up the door. If you see me lean this way also. Because you have a direct line of sight to the Astros out that window. I do not. So if you're all wondering what I I keep on doing, yeah, I'm going left. That's to check the Astros game as we record this. Great point. I'm checking my phone for the Astros game. That's what I'm looking for. So, yeah, that's what's happening, people. We look distracted. Yeah, I might have to throw that on the – actually, can I I make a hot take real quick? The Fox Sports Go app is awful. Is it? Compared (laughs) to the ESPN app, the Fox Sports Go app. I've it's actually, dog crap. I remember it's, the it's first terrible. time having to try to use it last year, and I gave up because it, it wasn't don't work. Working. It was something for the U.S. Open or something. Do you like watch like, it no. live? Is that what you're supposed to do? Yeah. You can. Oh, okay. Yeah, because you can't, you can't you can. watch replays. Like, watch ESPN, you can go back and watch replays. So, like, when Texas plays an ESPN game, I won't bother recording it because I know I got to watch ESPN. I can go back and watch the replay, and then I can rewind it and fast forward. Okay. Like, that's why. So, like, it's oh, a Fox game. I didn't know that. Yeah, and since the two Fox games this year have been double overtime games, so it yeah. runs long, and I missed the tail end, so i got to wait till somebody puts it on YouTube to go watch it and watch it for my film review. But anyway, uh, Matt, everything good, man? Other yeah, than, man. Uh, uh, been a little bit upset the way these last couple innings went for the Astros, but just go ton- Yeah, right now it's pure sports. I'm in head deep into uh, NBA stuff already. It's football season, and then you got – baseball going on so quite busy but quite Good fun baseball all right Playoff the, baseball. The, i say that about the fox sports go app and now it's working for ah, me so. nice. there you go. karma my friend yeah. well then we need all updates right. that's all all right, all right. random yeah. updates nice. but by the way uh as i told you guys i was at game one last thursday so now i hate taking days off during football season because it just completely screws up my content schedule yeah. and plans but i was like you know what i was in houston for a speaking engagement rod you've been over there yeah. with oh, yeah. to, there. to the Got houston it. lunch Texas, group Texas, yeah and uh, spoke to Houston Lunch Group, and then my buddy and I were talking about it a few days before. He's like, hey, why don't we go over to game one when you're done? That's awesome. And I was like, hey, we can make that happen, can't we? Yeah. So 
We ended up buying the standing room only tickets. Hell yeah. Um, ended up getting some good spot. Good it was because it wasn't a sellout, was it? Was it? Um, it's you guys still found. You guys, you guys had seats though, right? Was forty three. Hold on, no, no, hold on, hold on. There you go. Uh oh. Standing. Yeah, I can tell by. We We're tied. Yeah, yeah. tie game. Go, go, go Bregman. Go Strolls. Yes. Dude, Bregman is balling. Bregman to the Number Green Monster. Pick. Yeah. Yes. Uh, anyway, this will all be dated by the time you guys listen. Like, yes, <laughs> yes, we're, yes. We're watching this in real time. Be on the but no, yeah, no, I, I went to uh, work for myself. I went to work. game. I went to game one, man, and it was electric. It was. Uh, I owed it to myself as an Astros fan. Oh, no question. This was going to be my one time to attend a playoff game, so nice. I jumped on With it. Altuve hitting three home runs, and I was one of the greatest playoff oh, performances man, in awesome. Astros history. And last time I went to a playoff game w- for the Astros was standing room only tickets for that. 18 inning marathon. The Chris Burke walk see. off. Yes, yes. So Jeff and I, some fun in times. Yeah. Some games like that. We're good luck. Mm-hmm. We're good luck. Uh, a man who's always good luck, who loves his H Town sports, loves everything about H Town because it's his town. Uh, lifetime Longhorn, 2002 UT All American, 2002 semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award, fourth round draft choice of the New York Giants back in 2003. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and he over the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the CFL. As it turns out, one of the. Uh, Shadiest organizations in the CFL getting in bed with Art Briles and Johnny yeah, Manziel. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, didn't they dismiss uh, Art too? Oh, after like with after, a few after, hours. after they got publicly shamed. They oh, we didn't know that. They, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They, they actually uh, said they did their homework on the front end too, and then they said, "Oh, I guess our homework wasn't done well." Yeah, yeah. twenty-four hours. Dog, dog <laughs> must ate that homework. <laughs> uh, but anyway, when he was done in Canada, got himself back to Austin, Texas, in a forty acres where he earned his degree. If he had a T-ring like Corey Redding and Ricky Williams got theirs over the weekend. Oh, yeah, from Mike Perrin. They he got would, it from the man. He deliver. would wear it proudly. Maybe deliver. when you reorder yours, Mike Perrin will deliver it to you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great if Mike Perrin do- hand delivered all T-rings. All that would be really He's cool, like my actually. Business, my schedule's too booked. I'm just... That would be great, these. actually. I would like. Actually, I think I now I want that to happen. I would like a. Hand I would hope they wouldn't say, "Hey, Rod B, you want you head over to Moncrief if your ring is ready." And it's oh, just that's like definitely the way it's sitting on the secretary's desk, like next to the schedule posters and stuff. That is the definitely the way it's gonna happen. What are you talking? <laughs> <laughs> that's how it happened last time. <laughs> and Mac was here last time. Where, where's 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 Rod's tea ring? It was in that box. Oh, I think we moved it in the players' <laughs> lounge. It's back there. It's, in, it's down there with Chip in the equipment yeah. room. Go check it out. Yeah. No, that's definitely how it's gonna be done. Sure. Uh, but if he had a tiering, he would wear it proudly. Nonetheless, he's a card-carrying member of DBU, which is just as big of a deal if you play oh, it man. on a 40 It's balling record. these days. Number 21 in your program, number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. And Rod, I had to remind you it was 15 years ago that you left your mark on the on, – you have to call it by its real name, the AT&T Red River Showdown. Yeah. But back when you were in it, it was still the shootout. It was still a shootout. It was politically incorrect. It was still a shootout back then. Now – we don't, you know, the references to guns make people uncomfortable. So, yeah, now it's a Red River rivalry or the yeah. Red River showdown. It, as I as call they, it the State Fair Street Fight. That's it used to be the Washington Bullets, so then they had to change it. Let me just say this. Culture Anybody who's worried about gun references offending anyone with Texas OU has not been to that game. Yeah, because there's a lot more offensive stuff going on. Yeah. <laughs> During the State Fair and mm-hmm. grandma's over there flipping you the bird. <laughs> that's just more the yeah. networks and has selling something and being have the sellable product and maybe don't want to yeah. have a shootout brought to you by. So then they're like, okay, it'll be easier for us to make more money by changing the name. That doesn't I've matter. always – Fans when, can call it what we want. Even when I was a kid, I loved this game. But it wasn't until I went that I really got the full experience of it. Yeah. And I'll never forget, man, my wife and I are walking through the parking lot into the fairgrounds. And it's a 2.30 kick. And this is probably like – it's a good 90 minutes before kickoff. Okay. And there's a guy, his friends are struggling. To, he's an OU fan. They're struggling to get him back to the car. He shakes him off and says he can walk. He takes about three steps and then face plants on the concrete. <laughs> and at that point, I'm like, yeah, it's a different beast out here. Oh, man, he ain't the only one. That's the thing about that 230 kick, too, is people will be a little bit more belligerent, I should say. There'll be, a, there'll there'll be, be some be, more electricity in the building. Yeah, there'll be a lot more tipsy uh, fans out there on both sides. And they're normally on 811 just because yeah. can, you can only consume so much alcohol that early in the morning. Now you got like two or three more hours. Yeah, normally you're waterlogged and then like wake up hungover because you have to get up early yeah. just to drink to stay up. So then now you actually do have a little party for the pregame atmosphere. Good point. Barad, I talked about it 15 years ago was your last OU game, and you made a play that at the point in the game it looked like things were swinging yeah, the momentum. way of the Longhorns. Yeah, I remember that. Um, those of you not unfamiliar with what we're talking about, I, it's on my Twitter account. I tweeted it out uh early Monday morning to officially start OU week. But, Rod, what's going through your mind when you're making that play? And I know 
there used to be a section in the media guide when players were asked, what's your what's your dream moment, your dream scenario? Mm-hmm. And for a lot of guys, it was making a play to win the OU game, making yeah. a play to win the OU game. I agree with that. And Rod, you, you made a play that looked like it was going to go a long way toward winning the OU game with the pick six. It didn't. Uh, it, it, now I remember that play, too. I don't know if – there's a more electrifying play that I've made uh, while I've been on the 40 acres than that pick six. Just considering like the uh, the mat, it was my senior year magnitude of the game. I believe we're both ranked real high. I'm not two sure. versus three, two versus three exactly. I mean that's essentially national title hopes are on the line. Uh, Texas fans are really frustrated because they've been beaten by Oklahoma in the last two years. Stoops had won a national title with two years prior to that too. We're watching it right now. Yeah, and it it, it really was like that. I, I would say that probably is my favorite play all time. I hate to, I really do. I hate to take enjoyment out of it because we lost. So like to me, it's like it's like an empty, it's like an empty satisfaction. Like we lost the damn game. You know, I mean, there's no, I can't really take any pride in that play because in the end we lost, and that's right. to me that's like celebrating being in the friend zone. I mean. Yes, that the goal is to win that game. That that play wins the game. Hell, man. Um, hell, who knows? My career might be different. I mean, we have no idea what could happen if I would. Could we play? End up playing in a national title or something if we right. win that game. Um, so yeah, it's it's one of those. It's kind of weird for me to celebrate it. I like seeing it when you posted it. It always makes me feel good to to watch it. But in the end, I keep thinking about man, we lost the damn thing. Like we didn't win the game. Literally, the next, not the next play, because the next play is a PAT. The play after that, the return of Oklahoma, they returned it down deep in Texas territory, yeah. snatched all the momentum right, yeah, right from us. Savage. Yep, snatched all the momentum from us. Dorian McCullough saved the day, though. He saved yeah. the touchdown. Yeah, but that's how that game goes. I mean, we had so much momentum. You go look at that crowd after I take that, that take it to the house. I oh, mean, they're yeah. losing it. People are going crazy. And really, Oklahoma sucked all the life out of that crowd when they returned it deep in our territory. I don't know if they got a touchdown there or a field goal. But no, they did. Trent, it was Trent Smith. Touchdown? Yeah. yeah, that killed us. That killed us. Yeah, boy, you're still, though, pick six is uh, second all time, just behind, is it Huff Daddy? I think I'm maybe third sports? now because Houghton Hill actually. He tied you, I believe. Okay, because uh, Houghton Hill's going to surpass everybody. Houghton Hill. Yeah. Hell, Deshaun Elliott is like leading the nation in picks now with five. Deshaun Elliott's closing in. He's going to close in on Earl Thomas' single season school record with yep. eight. It's eight, eight right? Yeah, yep. he's got five he's already. five already. Yeah, he'll, he'll definitely close in on it. He will, he'll get close to Rod, it. Rod, I'll look up the. Uh, he'll I get got close it right to it. here somewhere. It's in yeah. the game notes. No, but just, yeah, Rod's three pick sixes behind uh, uh, Huff's notes. four. Yeah, Huff is number one. Huff is number one, I think. Yep, Huff has yep. got four. Yeah. But yeah, man, I bet that moment, just that that memory, at least yes, it, career, like you're saying, you don't want to have moral victories. But that's exactly still, what that would be. Could, uh, you know, you still one of your three to be second all time in school history. Career interceptions, return for touchdowns. Michael Huff is first. With Huff four, Daddy. Yep. And then Rod, you're tied with Holton Hill and Greg Brown for second. Holton I, Hill, Greg exactly Brown. Yeah. What I said. Yeah, and Holton Hill's done it, and I mean, he's got in two basically two years, he's gotten those three. He'll even surpass me, no question. He'll get another one before he's done. So there you have it. We'll talk plenty of Texas OU, but gentlemen, let's talk about K State, and we can debate how good of a K-State team this is, um, whether it's going to be one of Bill Snyder's better teams. I think it's still a team that you can look up at the end of the year and maybe they're probably an eight-win team, maybe nine with a bowl. Who knows how the, yeah. how the league season is going to play out for K-State. But, Rod, you've been on the field with, with K-State teams. We've seen this rivalry. We've dissected it. We know how hard it is for Texas to beat Kansas State, the style of play mm-hmm. Kansas State has uh, that, that, that they've won a lot of games with. Uh, anytime you're Texas and you beat K-State, it's a big deal. I agree. Yeah, and, I, 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 and, and you heard, and I think you uh, tweeted out too, and uh, Tom Herman brought it up in the press conference. I heard him say it again. It's a, it's a big – maybe he's just saying it because he thinks the, kid, the kids are using this term now and it's a cool term to use. But the, it, it's a culture. He did it for the culture. Yeah. It was a big win for the culture. And it was kind of the way they went. They won it. Um, you know, they had to – they had to fight. I mean, they were down at first. Mm-hmm. That's one of those games, honestly, Texas loses. You know, I, I've seen them lose those games the last three years more than they win those types of games. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? See, what we were exactly saying while we were watching the game was, like, it, this is a good sign. We're starting to see these signs in games like that, say, where you used to maybe not step up and be able to win the game. 
Texas coming through, but also where we have situations with the quarterbacks that it's now maybe not a uh, bad that we had a quarterback controversy. Now it's good. We're turning in the right direction because we're having more depth and then ability to perform late in these things. This year, you're seeing more signs of positivity than it being the same as the same stories had been for seven straight years where you make that mistake and lose or your quarterback comes back mm -hmm. in and makes the mistake, doesn't play well. So it's good to see some of the trending in the right direction. Let's start with the most important position on the field because there is no longer a quarterback controversy. Yes, there is. No, there's not. Quit saying that. It's there's not because of, you it's don't believe smart. that. But if you ask the man, Tom Herman, there is a he will not declare a quarterback. Then there is a quarterback I question. Think, mark. I think there's, there's a quarterback question mark. I think it's more games. Oh yeah, definitely. There, but that's well, still course, but good. I, but it's still my point. Yeah. The initial point was that. He's got in his head, he's got a plan. I don't know what some of his plan is, but it's a plan. I think the plan is I just want to make sure I got Shane and Sam for the long haul, meaning mm -hmm. I got him for 2018. And he is going to straddle the fence as long as he can. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know make how if Sam has another hard. performance like he did versus K-State. It's going to be really, really tough to kind of, you know, kind of straddle the fence and really kind of play this a very delicately the way he's trying to do it. But man, did you? They asked him about the quarterback. What yeah. did he say? I gotta watch film on Sam. Yeah. You gotta watch film on Sam. He did not see what we saw, or he did, and he won't admit it. Yeah, I you know think that's I mean? it. I think well, that's. I think it. it's but, in, but either in way, between the two. It's still a quarterback controversy, and it's guys. Only this, smart. this question is not. This, this, is, this debate is not settled, and it won't be settled this year. Well, and it could even not be settled next year because the kids are freshmen. No, no, no. no it'll be regression. settled next year. It'll be settled next year. It won't be settled this year because you're going to need both of these quarterbacks to win this year. You've already needed two quarterbacks. You're five games in, mm -hmm. and you needed two of them. And if you think Sam Ellinger's going to make it through a whole football season no, playing not. the way he plays, no, exactly, you are delusional. Delusional. No, you're delusional. You are, are they got plays like a linebacker. I'm saying, well, I'm no, saying no, if you're if you're talking about He's not going to say that one guy's our starting quarterback that. for the multitude of reasons that he's going to want him to continue to perform well in practice. They're going to have to continue to progress on the field and know that if you make a mistake, you're going to be held accountable. But obviously, Ellinger fits him better and maybe playing better. It's the, just, the, and like he said, there's no reason to even tell anybody who my quarterback is. Can, I, can, can, I, can I finish a thought here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ronnie Millsap can see that Sam Ellinger is the best quarterback option that Texas has right now. I agree. Like it's not. I don't it's, think there's yeah, no I mean, secret. Nobody's debating that. And well, Tom yeah. Herman can spin it however he wants. And I don't even think he said I, that. Tom Herman can spin it however he wants. I, I know what the eye test showed on Saturday. And look, you got to break this down multiple ways, Rod. We we've seen this before, where the young quarterback has a big game mm -hmm. and. At some point, people get film on him, and they figure out mm -hmm. how to defend him, and then it's the, up on the staff and the player to adjust. Agreed. We've seen Tyrone Swoops not be able to make that adjustment. We've seen Gerard Hurd not be able to make that adjustment. Hell, mm -hmm. go back to the last three games last year Shane and the Bouchelle. two games this year. We've seen Shane Bouchelle not be able to make Agreed. that adjustment. So my point is we're the controversy part is we're a long way from deciding that Sam Ellinger is unquestionably – the future of this program and the future of the quarterback position. Agreed. But I'm not worried about that. I'm not even thinking about that. I'm thinking about the here and now. Let's look ahead to Saturday. Mm -hmm. Your best option to win football games right now at the quarterback position at the University of Texas is Sam Ellinger because for two reasons. Number one, with the offensive line situation being what it is, I think you're at the point now where mobility at the quarterback position and the ability to extend the play – Trump's experience and ball security, which is, I think, the thing that the coaching staff really likes about Shane Bouchelle. I think it's three things. I think his accuracy, I think ball security, and I think his experience. But you're in a position right now where the mobility and the ability to extend the play and create has to trump those things, I agree number that. one. And number two, this offense has been subpar, to say the very least, through four games. Now that you've got something that's actually working, you've got some momentum coming out, mm -hmm. real momentum against a quality defensive opponent on that side of the ball, you can't afford to tinker with that. You've got to roll with it. You've got to see how much juice you can squeeze out of this orange. Every look, I think everybody agrees with everything you just said. Mm -hmm. and I think Tom Herman yeah, probably does too. I think Tom Herman probably does too. But Tom Herman's got, he's got a long-term vision. He's looking at the macro, not just the micro. And I'm telling you, sometimes your long-term goals, they trump your short-term goals. And and I think in this situation, his long-term goal may be trumping the short-term goal, which is short-term goal should be winning games and trying to have the offense be as productive as it possibly can be. It He's he's smarter than we are. 
He's paid more money to be smarter than us. I get Mensa, that. he's smarter than us, Jeff. He knows more football than us combined. He sees what you see. Why won't he name a starting quarterback? There's a reason for it. The Multitude. reason he won't do it is because he needs both of these guys invested, fully invested. He he can't win with just Sam, and he can't win with just Shane right now. Because even you point this out, the guy that's going to lead this this uh like the the Tom Herman vision for the future may not even be on campus right now. We're not even sure about that. Yeah. But mm-hmm. the guy that's most compatible with the offense, of course, it is Sam Ellinger. We all right know that. Now, it's pretty yeah. obvious. But if that guy won't name a starter, then some people believe he's actually hindering the 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 the, the progress of this team. Like the leadership and this team, the locker room, all those types of things. He doesn't care about that right now. When he's, he's got priorities it. right now of his own. His priorities yeah. are, I am not going to name a starting quarterback. He says, I got to watch the film. Really? He wants to believe you got to watch the film? What do you got to watch? I'll tell you what you need to know. He yeah. knows this, man. He is he is playing this very close to the vest. He's being very delicate, very deliberate about what he says because he knows as soon as he names Sam the starter, Shane's going to check out. Well, Shane's going to check out. And I'm telling you, when Shane human checks nature. out, it's human, it's human nature. It's, it's and when he checks out, he's got he's a conne- he's connected to it. Y'all don't realize. So remember, he's connected. If, if, if the transfer rate for quarterbacks is already 50%, mm-hmm. what do you think the transfer rate for that guy is who started an entire year his freshman year at the University of Texas is going to be? He's already getting calls probably, dog. It's, he's already getting text messages. He's yep. already – people already hit him up. Man, I'm telling you. He'll be the most coveted free agent. Especially He'll be the starting quarterback, best quarterback for Oklahoma in two years, man. It's, it's going to happen. And, and, and Tom Herman's saying, listen, I am done with this vicious cycle of quarterback hell we've been going through. All right, and the only way the best quarterbacks in the history of Texas football have been what? Red shirted quarterback. Go look at them, man. It ain't rocket science. And even when you were in quarterback purgatory or quarterback heaven with Chris Sims and Major Upway, you never got to maximize either one of them. Why? Because you, you didn't red shirt Sims and you played Major before it was time, and then you ended up in this cluster. You know what I mean? He wants yeah. to avoid that, man. It's pretty obvious what he's trying to do. He wants to register both of those 2018 quarterbacks and have both of these guys here in 2018. That way, the, the cycle of quarterback hell is broken. Like Basically, for the, for the rest of his tenure here, he can break that cycle. Yeah. Unless you do that, dude, you're going to end up in this situation just like this next year. I can guarantee you. You want to know why? Because the last seven years, we've been here. Yep. Every no. year. And I agree <laughs> fully on all Every of Every year. And then if you want to add another <laughs> layer on top of it, too, if you think about just what can come from him divulging info like that, for if you keep it right now and not naming one, first off, you don't have people writing stuff saying one guy is the winner, one's a oh, loser. Man. Nobody's speculating on where Bouchelle goes. It All it does is open up a door. If you name one, it de- like Rod was saying, first off, on the field, it's like – I'd say in the team overall, they know who is good. They know who's going to go out there and play every single they Friday. They know that. But inside the locker room, it's no big deal to them. It's big to everybody outside the locker room who's the starter, name a starter. That really, I don't think, even matters to them inside. They're going to have the better one start. It can, by naming one, only open up a Pandora's box of headlines of guys, being one being the clear one, one being the other one. That opens up that idea of not only having the chance of transfer, but then it's going to be able to have you sit there and bring stuff that just doesn't even need to be brought because it doesn't matter at all. The better one's going to play, and it would just be creating more for him to answer and things along those no, lines. I, I don't care. And it tips I, off OU. I don't care. Well, okay, let's look. Let's break that down a couple ways. Number one, I don't really care if he names a starter or not. It's no sweat off my back. I, okay. Because, I, again, as we talked about, we know what we saw on Saturday. Okay, exactly. And as far as the Oklahoma thing, I'm going to go ahead and guess that Mike Stoops and Ruffin McNeil and that defensive staff, Already. they're probably not going to watch a lot of Shane Bouchelle film nope. this week. They, they're they're going to prep for Samuel. But in the attention they're to gonna detail They're going to pop world, in SC, and they're going to pop in K-State, agreed. and they're going to break that down. But in the in analytical way they can. world, they, if we talk about the details and the accumulation of everything and how much Herman values everything, yeah, even if it's 1% or 2% that they would put to it. That's a little bit. That's just a tiny amount. And those things, when you add up the entire week and everything being involved, they can accumulate to something because we talked about how those deficiencies deteriorated Texas for so long, too. Yeah. No, I, 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 I agree with everything you said, Jeff. And I think every like all of us are making good points. And the point is, I just think he has a larger goal. And it's not, it's not going to stay this way. I don't, if, if Sam Mellon goes there and beats Oklahoma. And has right. 450 yards, or, he, or even in a if they lose and he's but and he's he, not the reason why they exactly. lose. Exactly, and know? he plays an extraordinary game like yeah. he did for K State, and they lose, or even like versus USC a little bit. You know what I mean? I think he may be compelled 
tail wagging a dog type of thing to declare one way or the other. But if he can straddle the fence, if, if there is any type of, uh, uh, you know, a minuscule little bit of room for him to, to straddle the fence, he's going to do it. Mm-hmm. And right now the injury of Shane gives him all the reason he needs to go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me let me look at Shane. Make sure he's all right first. But I think we all know where yeah. he's leaning. Right, he's got to be leaning towards. Yeah, that. Matt, you hit on this a minute ago, and, and I want to kind of expand on it because I think it's a good point. The, the guys in the locker room know, and the coaches know. And I keep hearing people like throwing out this. There's well, Sam's a better vocal leader, and he's this and he's that. I think the guys in the locker room respect both of these guys. And Rod, mm-hmm. you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I think vocal leadership and being a rah rah guy, I think it's one of the most overrated things in sports. I think the best leaders I've been around, whether it's guys in sports, guys in the corporate world, whatever, it's the people that when they speak, they have enough credibility and respect among their peers that you listen to what they say. Agreed. Yeah. So I don't think it matters if Sam's got more swagger or Shane's got this or whatever. I think they, I think these guys on this team have both seen these guys get it done to where whichever one of them is in the game, I think they've got confidence in both of those guys yeah. to lead them. I don't think – that's a question but I to me I think it goes back to you've kind of found something now offensively and let's start breaking down this K-State game and you know the offensive lines uh Sam Ellinger had a couple of plays that were negative like called quarterback runs that Mm -hmm. were negative yardage plays but Rod if I'd have told you going into this game that the offensive line situation being what it is, which we found out late in the week, Zach Shackelford was injured, yeah, Terrell mm-hmm. Cooney was going to have to start, Denzel Okafor goes from being in the doghouse to your starting left tackle and plays the whole game. If I'd have told you that group would play 91 snaps through four regulation quarters and overtime, and you would have five negative yardage plays all together out of those 91 snaps, yeah. you'd probably say that offensive line played well above expectations, and that's exactly what they did. They did, but I, I also think there's a, a butterfly effect and a domino effect. And I agree with you. Basically, his offensive line is missing their top four best offensive linemen. Right. I, I wrote this. This is my offensive right. line story afterwards. I was like, if you go back to camp and you tell Tom Herman, Tim Beck, and Derek Wareham, you sit them down and say, okay, going into the K-State game, right. no Connor Williams, no, no Elijah Rodriguez, Rodriguez yeah. no Zach Shackelford, no, no Patrick Ben-Kirk. Hudson. What do you think happens? They're probably like, we're, we're screwed. Yeah. Yeah, especially versus, versus K State, yeah. which is a line of scrimmage. We're probably scoring game. six points. Yeah, we're gonna have to hope to get a non-offensive touchdown to even have a chance. Yeah, I agree with that. But this is the with the domino effect of having a plus one, a a guy, true dual threat player as your quarterback. And I, I know it sounds crazy. This is about the compatibility, right? There, it improves so much, so many other things on that offense when you have a true kind of plus one in numbers game in the running game. And I know Tom Herman's like, I don't need a dual threat guy to, you know, to, go, to be my signal caller. And I agree, you don't need one, but look at what a dual threat guy does mm-hmm. to a Tom Herman offense. It's, I mean, it's so obvious now. If you've got Ezekiel Elliott or Carlos Hyde at running back, you probably don't need one. Yeah, yeah but even I would say, yeah, I mean, but need is relative, right? I don't need indoor plumbing, but damn, it makes right. my quality of well, life really good. Like, you don't, yeah, you don't need There them, are a multitude Herman, of but, things that it makes it better, but then just the secondary play, just the fact that no matter what a defense can be schemed to beat you fully, yet you can win the play because you have one guy's extra skill set on top of it. Play breaks down. He can extend the yeah. play, make something out of nothing. Offensive linemen don't have to block as long because he can get outside the pocket and make things happen. Defensive linemen, they're just more cautious because, man, I got to stay in rush lanes. I can't crash down can't this play hard because man man this guy, yeah, this, this, this guy obviously can hurt me. I got to keep contained. There's so many different things you have to worry about when you're playing against a plus one in the running game at the running at the a quarterback because he's basically the you know he's basically Texas right now best running back and their best quarterback right uh-huh. in the backfield. Right to your point, <laughs> that's kind of the point I was making though. The the need for a running quarterback becomes greater when your offensive line situation is the way it is. And your running back situation is still not oh, resolved, man. and and I don't think yeah. it's going to be resolved throughout the year. I Tony think Carter was he was he was a bright light for I, us. I, I think they're either going to have to. And Tom Herman mentioned today because I asked about you know how pleased he is with the freshmen because I mean, this is a freshman class that go back to February when they were signed it was the lowest ranked class in in the dot com era of recruiting mm-hmm. rankings. And, but you look at the contributions they've gotten from the true freshmen. You talk about Ellinger, Derek Kerstetter Kate started Brewer. two games now. Tony Carter, Cade Brewer. Taquan Graham played against K-State and yeah. looks like he's going to be a big piece of a defensive line going forward. So you're getting some quality contributions from a group mm-hmm. that you didn't think you were going to need to lean on all that much this year. And not only are you getting immediate contributions, but the upside of that group looks really nice. Yeah. So I say all that to say, 
unless Tony Carter or Daniel Young, and Tom Herman mentioned Daniel Young, they want to maybe get him in the mix more. Unless to. one of those young cats takes off, right? I think the running back situation is pretty much going to be by committee all year. They don't have that. They don't go back to the guys Tom Herman's had in his past. They don't have an Ezekiel Elliott, a Carlos Hyde, a guy that you know you could put it in his belly. They don't even have 20, a Catalan. Twenty, yeah. <laughs> they don't have a guy, as you say, they don't have a guy right now that, that at the running back position that really has that X man ability they to don't. either be a pile pusher or mm-hmm. you're a home run threat or yeah. you're a great receiver out of the backfield. Great. Yeah, Tony Carter and Daniel Young aren't ready yet, and I think they've determined that Chris Warren and Kyle Porter just aren't those guys. They're nice, serviceable guys, but neither one of those guys is special. Seems that way. Um, that it, through, I would have to agree with them at this point. Through five games, it, I think that's they've what, proven correct. Right. Yeah. That's what you would think the staff's opinion is based on how they've been used and based on the productivity. Again, hard as you to argue. Said, yeah. You All, was, I mean, that San Jose State game is kind of the outlier, right. but other than that, it's like San Jose State's defense was just atrocious. You know right. I mean? But I say all that to say this: that those issues brings up the need to have a quarterback that can extend the play and can create on his own. Kind of freestyle a little bit. You need that element with your running back situation and your offensive line situation. Because, Rod, I want to get away from K-State real quick, and I just had this random thought that I want to throw out at you. What the type of athletes you can recruit at Texas? Because we talk, And, and I, we might have hit on this last week. I don't remember. But you talk about this offense being a, a pro-spread offense. That's the, uh, the, the label okay. that's been thrown on. And – the team that I look at at any level of football that's done the best job of marrying the pro with the spread mm-hmm. are the Kansas, Kansas City, City Chiefs. Yeah, we talked about it. Did yeah. we talk about? Have we talked about mm-hmm. this? Yeah, we talked. Okay. Well, we talked. I mean, I, Brought I it up about at Kansas the end of City. the show a couple yeah. weeks ago. Because Deshaun, I mean, because I'm with you on that. I, I think Andy Reid right now mm-hmm. has the best hybrid um, offense of college that's right. concepts. We did talk about this. Yeah. yeah, and the NFL. I agree with you 100 percent though. I, I think honestly, that's I, that's Tom Herman's ideal offense is Kansas City. Yeah. yeah no so, question. you know, I you agree. can see it work. You, I see that offense working more. Like, and I'm just looking at the Chiefs, right? Yeah, I agree with you. To me, Sam Ellinger is more along the lines of Alex, Alex Smith, Smith, and then once they transition to Patrick, Patrick Mahomes, Mahomes, then what you've got with Shane Bouchelle. No doubt. So And, they, and, just, and Alex Smith, and they, Texas couldn't keep him, and they lost J.J. White and Whitney Merciless. But going back to your point – they couldn't keep him contained inside the pocket. Alex Smith kept getting outside the pocket and they buying more time and looking downfield. And they it, they really did. They that's, that was a big part of the the reason they were so successful is because they were always able to get Alex Smith outside outside of those defensive ends and outside that pass rush. So man, I, I agree with you 100. percent I think that this offense with Sam Mellinger at the helm is way it, it, it's way more threatening. It has so many more dimensions now offensively. Uh, you know, like with the wide receivers, you you got to now devote another guy, put a guy in the box to stop this dude. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to. Mm-hmm. Or Texas possibly can, you know, kind of gain traction in the running game. You do that, and Colin Johnson and the way Reggie Hill Map is playing, and one-on-one on the outside, that's that's the that's the matchup you want if you're Tom right. Herman. That's all you need. Let, let's give Tim Beck some credit here because we've, we've, ba- we've bashed on Tim Beck through four games. This is true. Um, he deserved it, too. Aside from red zone play calling, which is still atrocious, and I'm kind of dumbfounded as to why this team is just Not having a so, running back hurts you, yeah, kills you in the red just zone. so odd. Uh, when that field compresses. Yeah, it and, just kills yeah, you, man, not having a running back. You lose back. the ability to go vertical. Yeah, right? it's just we'll talk about red zone here in a minute because there's a couple different layers to that. But I it goes to show you, too, Rod, when you do have the ability to run the football, or at least the threat is there that you can run the football. Mm-hmm. For this offense in particular, and we talk about pro passing concepts and all that stuff, yeah. when you can really dig into the play action game Man. and really dig in, we see now what this offense is all about. Because go back and watch Tom Herman's offense yeah. at Houston. When they were able to get in their play action series, yeah. that's when you can start Open really getting the creative. And it, yes, yes, exactly. Yep. And the route that I, the call that I love, it was a great call and great execution. Love the delayed release to Chris Warren. On the oh, phone, that was back nice. The Last side. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, it looked like that throwback they had against USC, except they did that one like down deep in the red zone. Yeah, and, and it was kind of same love, concept. You know, you look yeah. at and, and you know misdirection, kind of looking at what Tom Herman did at U of H. They love those routes where you can put a guy on a delayed release, whether it's a it's a receiver on a late yeah. release or a back that's going to kind of block at the line of scrimmage, then boom, leak out late. I love that play That's call. That's one of the things you just set somebody up the whole game with, though. You yeah. know what I mean? You're just watching that linebacker to see how disciplined they are about keeping their eyes on the running back. 
they forgot about him. You see, both of those those plays came late in the fourth quarter. It's one of those, that's why I love Andy Reid, right? Andy Reid, you can watch the, the play in the fourth quarter and go, mm-hmm. damn, he was setting that up in the first quarter. I yep. just saw that. You know what I mean? It's Brian Harson like. Like, I'm gonna, there's yeah, a reason Brian, I'm running this inside zone so damn exactly. much. It's because, reason I ain't gave that jet sweep all game. Once long, you commit to it, boom, I'm gonna hit exactly you. Exactly right. So else. I think that was that kind of a setup play. It shows you. Like you just said, maybe we got to give props to Tim Beck. Maybe oh, yeah. now as a play caller, he's starting to get his groove a little bit. You know what I mean? I think it's – maybe, maybe Ellinger, and see, or, or maybe Ellinger helps him get his groove. I like, think that's a big part of it. Yeah. That's also something, groove. though, that they could have been seen on because you put something there early in the game just to get yourself that ability to throw it. So I think they saw that in the – prep all season or all week long before it to be able to get that first play and then know that we're going to throw back over off of Warren yeah. off the same thing once with the safety commits because we went to it earlier so that one could be all of the above it could be preparation ended yeah. up setting I up and in, it, in game adjust that it's going to oh yeah now he's going to bite on that then we're going to get that touchdown against K-State that's 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 a that's a hell of a game oh, I mean, plan too when I K-State's saw that immediately I was like that was out teams. foxing the Snyder yeah they're the most disciplined teams in the Big 12 all the time Every Ch- check out this stat Rod Texas has 546 yards of total offense against K-State. In three games on the Charlie Strong era against K-State, Texas had 913 yards of total offense. In three games? Yes. 913 yards? Of total wow. offense in three yeah, games. Yeah, those were some ugly games. Had and Texas goes for 546. Wow. Against Another K-State hilarious stat. It, when you look at it, when you th- it just blew me away at who the second person to do it, but it was only the third 300-100 game for a Texas yeah, quarterback, and, and it was – Colt and Gerard, Gerard Hurt. Hurt, so it's a good point as to what we were saying before that you can have somebody go off as a freshman, but you still have room to progress going forward, and it shows how much different Texas football or just football was in general because, you know, the 267 passing, 200 running by Vince Young was unfathomable numbers back in the day. Yeah. But then nowadays, you know, you sort of look at it, and it's like, eh, those numbers aren't as big as they used to be. You Gerard know, Hurst. No 300, 100 ever? <laughs> That's crazy. I can't believe that VY only had one game. Game where he had 300 yards passing. No, he, well, yeah, because he never I think had it. was like to. Colorado. If he would have played those it. second halves, you could have had a lot yeah, it was more. Yeah, but, but I didn't realize because I was looking at that stat. I was yeah. like, why is VY not on that list? He's not on that list. Nope. Yeah. I remember when Colt was the first one to do it. Um, a couple other stats. One that I think is interesting. All three times Texas has defeated K State this decade, they've had a 100 yard rusher mm, in yeah. the game. It was Jonathan Gray in 13, Jonathan Gray again in 15, and then. Uh, Sam Ellinger on Saturday. Really weird, like, as much flack as Jay Gray gets, like, don't fault him for not showing up against K-State. When it's time to play K-State, Jay Gray, for whatever reason, Jay, Jay Gray was a up. good college it, it was, co- running back. All, all of Jay Gray's issues, in my opinion, were kind of like when things were outside of his control. Like, mm-hmm. it was like injuries mounting up. He, you know what I mean? Like, the durability factor coming out of high school. He was always the, the guy with great attitude. That's why all the coaches loved him, right? Mm-hmm. That's why Deontay Foreman couldn't start a damn game. In, in, in 2015, is because <laughs> they right. love Jonathan Gray so much. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, Rod, this series we also we we talk about it being a a, game, a series where winning the turnover battle and winning the rushing yardage battle it matters. It, it, it matters. Well, at least in the Stoops Mac era, it was huge. So maybe well, I'm still, still, still talking about the K State. Oh, K State, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and you look at it, Texas did end up winning the rushing yardage battle. On, yeah. uh, on Saturday. That's, I mean, that's that's that culture you're talking about. That's that physicality. I think only once, only once in this decade has the winning team not won the rushing yardage battle and the turnover battle. Uh, the turnover battle was even on Saturday, at one to one. Uh, you go back to 2011, Texas won the rushing yardage battle, lost the turnover battle in that home loss mm. to K State, where yeah. K State won having like 124 yards of total offense or yeah, it was whatever ugly. it was. U-G-L-Y. Yeah, taken out back and beaten with the ugly <laughs> stick. Uh, other uh, other news notes and nuggets coming out of the K-State game. Sam Ellinger throws for 380. That's the most ever by a Texas true freshman. Tenth most in school history. Uh, Kyle Porter's first multi-touchdown game. Brandon Jones' career high, 11 tackles. Uh, Reggie Hemphill with the first 100-yard receiving game for a Texas receiver against K-State since Mike Davis did it in 2010. That's mm. crazy. Yeah. And that was all like that was the Garrett Gilbert five I know, interception. I know what I'm like debacle. 20 yeah. 10? 52 times in that game, I believe, was the school record. Oh man. That's uh yeah. So speaking of ugly sticks. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Warren receiving touchdown and rushing touchdown in the same game. Just trying to go through my notes here, see if there's anything else cool. that really jumps out at me. Uh Reggie Hemphill, Maps, Denzel Okafor, Terrell Cooney, Gary Johnson make their first career starts against K-State. Rod, uh, we talked about the offense. We can go and back Bill there Max. once we talk about OU. 
I want to talk about the defense because you and I were texting, and I knew you and I were going to be on, on kind of on the same page on one of these things for sure because mm. we talked about it time and again. Uh, let's look at the short K-State passing touchdown, the one they yeah. scored to make it 17-7. Mm-hmm. Rod, for the life of me, explain to me again why as a defensive back you would not play inside leverage yeah, in the weird. red zone. I, I think it's just brain farts. It's the only thing I can think of. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to go make sure that I'm right that they – what kind of coverage they're in, they're in man like, coverage, which yeah, I believe they, I were, believe in they were in. I was going to make sure if I call people out about what coverage they were in. But I'm with you. But we've seen Pinter this. Zone. Even going back to Cedric Griffin in the 2004, like, Rose Bowl. I remember – was it Braylon Edwards? Braylon Edwards he's playing up against. Yeah. He's and in the Steve red zone. Preston. And he's off. He's playing off coverage and literally outside leverage. I'm like – well, why would you do that with that big giant dude? Of course, it's just he's gonna box you out. It's exactly what he did. goes out, and runs skinny posts, boxes them out. I remember asking Coach Aquino about. It. He was like, I, "You know, I didn't teach him that. You know, I don't. <laughs> right. You know, what I mean, you know, I don't, I'm not part. teaching that guy that exactly." So I'm always wondering if, if these guys are just they're because obviously they're in the red zone. Maybe they're really really tired already. Uh, you know, so conditioning may be part of it. But man, alignment, assignment, know the the down and the distance and the situation you're in. That's automatic inside leverage. Make them throw the toughest throw, which is the fade route. You have time to catch up to the fade route. The slant, hell, man, a slant. If the slant is thrown perfectly, it is indefensible. Mm-hmm. Indefensible, period. And that actually was not a badly thrown ball. It no. was like a sidearm, too. And it, it was decent coverage by, I think, P.J. Locke on it, right? Yeah. Decent coverage by P.J. Locke. But, man, make them throw the tough ball. The fade is a tougher ball for them to throw, and you have more time to catch up, there's more margin for error. With and the sidelines, your extra defender the on there. Side, like, so that, many other reasons. That's what, to like, do it. in yeah, Pee Wee football, that's what defensive. I remember middle school defensive backs are coach. When you're in the red zone, use the sideline as your extra defender. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm with you. I, I I don't understand. PJ likes. I mean, that's if anybody should be, you know, having that type of thought process, you think it'd be your your veteran. Yeah. PJ Lock. Yeah. But I remember go back to the. Uh, I remember when we first broach this topic right it was the west virginia game in 2010 yeah. <laughs> when there's a fourth and a fourth down like 12. a fourth and four on the 12 or something and carrington bond is playing outside leverage against uh yeah. it was i don't Tavon know it was Tavon Austin or Stephen Bailey, Bailey on the way and in. boom just a quick skinny post and it's six and it's like why are you bailing in the red zone and that's what are you doing you just i don't even know why guys are taking like steps back or anything it's it's such a compressed area you should flat foot read almost everything from that inside. Left. If some people, some guys like having their eyes on the quarterback. So a lot of these guys are probably trying to read the three step to make sure they have they can get the jump on the you know the quick the quick release and you know yeah. whatever what is it five step I mean not five step drop but a, a five yard kind of hitch or like a quick slant. So maybe they're trying to get a jump on it. But I I always figured man just flat foot read it put like your heels on the goal line essentially. And if he runs like a slugger, which is a slant and go, hell, he's got to run it through me, essentially. You know what I mean? So I can still flat foot read it. And if he runs a slant and I'm flat foot reading it, hell, I'm going to get a good jump on him anyway, especially if I'm inside leverage. I, I'm with you. I just I, when, I'm, when I'm talking it through with a young defensive back, I would love to, to see how they explain that to Jason Washington and the right. coaches. Speaking of inside leverage, uh, Sean Rogers went into the Longhorn Hall of Honor this weekend. Yeah. Which, which meant Casey Hampton was in town. He was. And, Rod, I, I tweeted I, – I replied to a tweet John Bianco put out with him and Casey Hampton, and Casey's got a big smile on his face. Man. And, Rod, we can go ahead and tell the story right now of uh, how you learned the lesson of playing inside leverage properly. Yeah. Uh, Casey had a big smile on his face. That's right. And there was a time where he did not have a big smile on his mm-hmm. face. It was because you gave up a third down, Rod, by not playing inside leverage. That's a mean, and that's a mean mofo, man. You don't want to see an angry Casey Hampton come up to you. I, I, I forget actually what game it was, but I, I, I remember that was our sophomore year, so I was scarred that I gave up a third down. It was like a third. It might be like a third and long. It was like a third and like eleven or something. So it was mm-hmm. it's one of those ones where like you should. You should, you know the situation. You, no reason to give that up. But one thing you don't realize about giving up, you know, third downs and those drives becoming, you know, eight, nine, ten play drives. I mean, the big boys are winded. Yeah, they thought out. he was about to get a yeah. breath. He thought so he was their gonna mind get is his like third down. Water. So they go really hard on third down. Not they don't go harder to play, but third down, they're thinking we're getting off the Get field. Break. I'm pass rushing. I've been working hard. I'm working hard. Yeah. So we, <laughs> all I do, all I remember is the guy catching like a six route, which is like an end cut. And I tackled him, and I remember looking up and almost getting eye contact with Casey on the field. And there's this look that Casey gives you where he, mm. he like, he, his head is, like, all, like, you know, to the side, and he's, like, staring at you. 
And he was just looking at me, and I was like, It's yeah. like he's flexing, but he's not. He was it's like, how he, is. he looked genuinely upset and stared at me. And then we got to the bench after that drive. He came over to the bench. And I was just, I was just drinking Gatorade, got my head down. I'm tired. And he's like, Hey, man, which one of y'all gave up that third down? I was like, I was like, that was me, Case. He was like, come on, Rob B. Come on, Rob B. You got to get on that, man. Get inside. I'm like, what you know about inside leverage? You don't know. You, you, you don't even know what coverage we were in. <laughs> That's in your you mind. Care. He's like, you need to get inside on that one. But, of course, I'm, I didn't say this to Case. I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no doubt, man. I was like, I got it, bro. I got it. I got it. But, yeah, he, I mean, he basically came over to try to punk me. And I remember, who was it? Oh, actually, our DB coach was Coach Withers did, yes, I believe, still. Yeah, Withers. And Coach Withers was giving us, like, you know, like, inside. He's got like, his dry erase board. And he's drawing stuff up. Literally, I think he interrupts Coach Withers, too, at the time and just starts talking. And Coach Withers just stares at him until he gets done. And then he walks out and Coach Withers starts up again. Like, that's how much respect that dude demanded. When he, like you said, when people talk, like when he talks, some people, you know, they listen. Like, when that guy talks, everybody listens, period. Yeah. You don't want Casey angry at you. You don't want Casey I've angry, I've heard some man. funny stories. You don't want to see that guy. That's the guy history. that played D-tackle for the Pittsburgh Steelers for more than a decade. When, Best when D-tackle in the history <laughs> of the three, Steelers, as and a he three, four, the mouth. As a 3-4 nose, when you make the Pittsburgh Steelers all-time team, yeah, you you're a badass. That dude, yeah, you don't want to mess. You want that dude You want that dude as your friend. You know what I mean? You do not want Casey Hampton mad at you. So. When, when Steelers fans talk about you in the same light, they talk about Mean Joe Green and Jack hey. Lambert. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, he's still – I mean, it's weird – his body shape. He almost, like, because Puna Ford is kind of squatty and, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, and really has a good center of gravity really because of the way his body is mm-hmm. built like that. And Casey Hampton is, Casey Hampton is bigger, but he is built like Puna Ford. He like reminds me squatty. of a bigger version of the Aaron Donald who you see now. Yeah, Aaron but Donald's kind of built pull, like yeah, that too. a little bit bigger, a There's, wide yeah. body Aaron Donald is yeah. what Casey would look the like. Be, the best Casey Hampton story that I've heard is he was playing, they don't do it anymore, but every year at coaching school they used to have the All-Star game, Texas High School Coaches Association All-Star game. Yeah. And Casey goes out for introductions and, like, his gut's hanging out. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, this guy looks sloppy. And the center <laughs> on the other team, I think it was a kid like maybe going to Boston College or something like that. Mm. And everyone was laughing at Casey until the ball got kicked off. And Casey Hampton apparently made this kid cry. Oh, I can believe it. I can believe it, dude. Like everyone was like, oh, my, like he is such a badass. Like, yeah, we, we don't need to make fun of this guy. No, Casey was a, and he was a mean spirited football player. Like when he was in football mode, like he was a nasty like. But they had a lot of those. Guys. Aaron Humphrey was like that. Like Sean yeah. Rogers was not as nasty as Casey. Like I always said, fully cruel Sean, Sean needed Casey. Casey made Sean nastier because they were like best friends, the freak and he knew how to like jab and motivate Sean. Because Big Sean was a big teddy bear. That was always a big complaint about. It. It was like, man, when that dude gets when, when Sean Rogers was actually pissed off, he played at a Casey Hampton like level, if not better. Like that when he was, but he wasn't. He didn't stay pissed off for four quarters like Casey Hampton did. Yeah, Casey could. Hampton was pissed off for four quarters. He led us in tackles. I want to say, two seasons. I would say led Texas in tackles for two seasons. It was at D tackle. I know he did one of them. And then a Dude. perfect example. Where, how do you explain, Sean? I've heard of people saying that he could three sixty dunk when he was he eighteen could. years old. He could so three sixty. Think dunk. about that. If you're the yeah. bigger six foot three, three hundred twenty pound, a, pound version, he was a better specimen. Dunk. It's like remind yeah. me of what Escalade from the street ball back in the day. No, I know Sean was more <laughs> athletic than Casey Hampton. Casey Hampton was a better football player than Sean Rogers. Yeah, just that simple. Um. There but was another. Uh, they was, both were on my D line, so yeah, it's pretty thank, I thank God for and that. Then you have a crazy man like Aaron Humphrey. <laughs> exactly. <on. laughs> then he's replaced by a Corey Redding. Like God. I was going to share something else, but then uh, Carlos Beltran double, uh, doubled off the Green Monster, and the Astros were up five three. Oh, Beltran! Woo! It's two thousand four all over again. <laughs> Go Strokes! But uh, no, man, those uh, Rod, those D lines you played on are great. And now I remember what I was going to say is we talk about the OU game. I do want to min- make another point with the defense against K State. A couple more points actually. Um, when you talk about this OU game, Tom Herman mentioned it in his press conference. The last OU game he was involved as a GA, his second and last one was 2000, the game Rod, that oh, you God. choose not to remember the score yeah. for. Tom Herman said it's burned in his brain, the 63-14. But that was a game That's where cool. uh, Mac wasn't happy with the team and thought told the media everybody played bad. And as legend has it, getting on the bus, DKR, yeah. Coach Royal pulls Mac aside and said, hey, mm-hmm. not everybody played bad because – 64 played his tail off. He was mashing people off. Yeah, there. yeah, he was. And I want to say we looked at the film and he was. He was like killing it. I mean, he had, it, they they couldn't block him, and I and that's how badly we played. They couldn't block Casey Hampton, and they still blew us up. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. 
That was a bad. That one. one still sticks with you though, doesn't it, Rod? Yeah, that was that was that one was tough because you know I don't think we understood what that game was all about, and it, I hate that it took us getting our ass whooped basically and getting embarrassed and shamed in front of the nation. And I don't feel that much shame because that that team was a really good team that went on to win a national title, but. Oklahoma, honestly, Oklahoma or Texas should never blow the other side out like that in that game. Right, <clears throat> it should never happen. Now, like I'll, that, I'll you know get to mean? that here in a minute. That means when you we, ain't ready when to we talk more about the OU game. But going back to K State real quick, I'm not as concerned about the quarterback run game because I thought K State did a really good job once Alex Delton was in the game. Mm-hmm. Of you know, it basically became like a wildcat package where you're snapping it to him, and they basically like mucked everything up. And I thought Delton did a really good job of just running where Texas didn't have saw bodies. daylight. You just saw yeah. daylight. Was, it's a good. He's got good vision as a runner, and that's exactly what they, it's basically made him a running back. It's quarterback running game. That's, yeah. That's and when Ertz came back in, I was sort of happy. I was like, man, that guy was being effective. All right, at least now it's sort of a good way to uh, describe the difference between having the dual threat option and not that. Now, okay, now we got a traditional quarterback in there. See what our guys can do. They've been doing. It all game. That well, dog even, guy, he had the ball in his hand. He could do it. Well, neither one of those guys are. I think Jesse Ertz has more functional mobility, but, yeah, but yeah, the way yeah. they utilize him, the way they weaponize him, they weaponize him like a dual threat quarterback. Yeah, so just the other one was dangerous. The other, seemed. exactly. I think the other one ha- is is like a true, true. kind of has athletic, sort of athletic Ellinger explosiveness. Exactly. Alex so, Delton apparently ran a four five one in high school and was just like a freak athlete out in yeah. the middle of nowhere, in Kansas, the K State, <laughs> just found and they were like, oh my god. I mean, he looked like do. it. It looked like, like it. Yeah. Um, but I think that you know that it, it is something about that uh, dual threat dynamic and dimension for any defense it's it, you seen it at the, the the nfl level with deshaun watson hey you see it with aaron Rodgers versus the cowboys don't you know what I mean? oh my God. you see it with Please, alex smith versus kansas it's exactly unbelievable so everywhere oh. you look now it is not almost uh it, it to me i think it's almost a standard functional mobility my guy hell and some guys are i think there's not even a, a, another scale i think aaron Rodgers has a little bit more than functional mobility. oh yeah He's romo cool. was functional mobility to me mm-hmm. aaron Rodgers has a little bit more than that my point is the the amount of problems and the amount of like uh riddles and conundrums that a dual threat quarterback presents to a defense are almost infinite. Like yeah. it's just I there's mean, just no way to, to solve. We talked about. Yeah, there's no way to solve all those problems. You are going to leave something open to that guy because you cannot account for all the unpredictability of that dual threat quarterback. Man, you're seeing it everywhere at every level. And in a nutshell, that's why Sam is. No, we're not going back to the offense, but that's why Sam's a better choice than Shane. We all know that. I mean, you have the conscience of the player always knowing, and then maybe makes you be on your heels, or you aren't being man. able to. You have to think of the idea of contain or like basic coverage. Now yeah. you're almost you overthink always it. Maybe you're you're overthink in zone it. because yeah. you can't be a man exactly. to man because he's going to run. Like there's so many levels. And then each player, you're wondering if they're being as aggressive, knowing that they have to think about the backside. You have just so many things. I think, I think a big, big part of it is conditioning. So people don't know this. Like a, having a defender do it to a quarterback, your defensive front seven is worn the hell out, the man, by the fourth quarter. The stats that the NFL yeah. does, how much more, more players have to, to run, run defending them. No, Dude. it is. It's like 40% more yeah. when you go against it's the a top ma- Your D-line gets worn out, so you expose the lack of depth on the uh, opposing front line, and your DBs get worn out. They're chasing wide receivers a whole lot longer. Yep. That that alone, dude, can wear it can wear defense out, which is why Sam Ellinger, I have to go look at it, may be a more effective runner, especially the way he runs the football, uh, in the fourth quarter than is in the first quarter. It's like the old adage, right? If you run th- those, those those runs in the first quarter, they don't pay off to the fourth quarter. Right. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Rod, one more thing I want to mention about the defense, and I mentioned the Delton thing, and I, I think that's something you can get cleaned up, and it's tough to yeah. make that kind of adjustment on the fly, especially when you know little no or nothing film about, on the, them, yeah, really, yeah, yeah. about the that. backup quarterback. Um, I did actually, if you're a Horse 24-7 member, I did actually put out an Alex Delton scouting report early, oh, did you, mid, dude, like you late da- Saturday morning. Deep dive right there, bro. I'd call yeah. that, call that K- He's the only one that Call that, that K-State contact, and it was exactly what he said. He's like, hey, man, he's much more of a raw thrower than Ertz. Wow. The passing game won't be there. It's like, but this kid can fly. He can scoot, and nice. he's damn good with the ball in his hands. That's okay. a good call by so. you, bro. You should have sent that to Tom Herman. You should have. <laughs> oh, you should, you should have sent them to Michelle. You should send this to his wife. She's yeah, a wifey. She's all over social media. Isn't she? I love her. Her and Nick Wright, man. That's uh, that's old school, man. That goes back yeah, to her. And, H- down yeah. When John Lopez and Nick Wright did a show together. You and think and Nick then, Wright's ever going to let that go? No. Why would you? That's like it's like Clay Travis, right? You find a group to just antagonize, mm-hmm. and Longhorn fans now will all, you with unanimity, hate Nick Wright. All going to click. And they're all going to click. Now, now Nick Wright can just troll what, the millions and millions of Texas fans? Yeah. 
every that week. Their whole and then, network's built his, on this yeah. thing. And then his wife will say something to Nick Wright, and then no, Nick Wright loves it. He's like, I don't give a damn. He's yeah. just trying to get people to yeah. get against that wall. Everybody's Jim Rome waiting for their Jim Everett moment. Yeah. Now. Oh, God. Uh, I, I would love to see somebody actually come across that desk at somebody again, though. That was an amazing Jim Rome moment. Right. It was. Uh, but, Rod, the one thing I want to talk about with the defense that kind of worries me as we transition to talking about the Chris. Oklahoma game, and i got to rewatch the game to see how much they did it, but against K-State it would make sense. It seemed like Texas played more single high safety, which, you know, you yeah, maybe yeah. want to drop that safety in the box. Uh, the middle of the field becomes vulnerable, and it might have been a two-safety look they were in. I think it was when they gave up the long touchdown. But I didn't see enough of – Guys, DBs knocking receivers off of their routes. There were too many times okay. where yeah. guys got free releases. So is that is that because of the coverage, or is that just yeah? You are supposed to try to knock that guy off of his route and not give him a free release to the middle. It of the all field. depends. Yeah, if you're in a zone coverage, ideally you would like to knock people off their. I haven't played for a defensive coordinator really at any level that when if we're playing zone that ideally they would not like you to get a hand on and reroute that yeah. receiver. Even, even if you can't, like, just, you know, you can't stonewall them and everything because you got to drop in the coverage and you're looking at your keys and all this. But they would ideally – they would hate for a guy to be able to run 12 yards up the field right by you without you rerouting Give him. that safety a chance to get over the top. Exactly, right? Yeah, make that guy run the long way around, make him run the hump, get your hands on him. And the best thing about zone is you really should be able to do that because – you're really kind of letting your safety down back there if you're letting that guy just run full speed and run a post route on him because mm, right. he's almost got – I mean, that's almost going to be open every time if the quarterback can throw him open, almost every time. So I agree with you on that. I think that's just – that's another thing that I'm sure that Todd Orlando will address and fix. We just forget this this group hadn't been playing together that long. I think we saw a little bit of regression in the K-State game. Yeah. But, no, but a, I, I a think our standards bit. are so high for this defense right now, too. It's fixable stuff, though. Exactly. I mean, you hear that, but you really see. I mean, it's look, if P.J. Locke just gets uh, on that post drive, if he just gives him a shove, then like, Brandon Jones had no chance to get over the no top time. on that yeah. post. No and shot. the one thing, Rod, I think this defense has been really good at that maybe we haven't given them enough credit for, especially since as many chunk yardage plays as we've seen around here lately, is limiting those explosive plays. Like, it's one thing, you go back to the Dominic yeah. Keith catch, it's one thing to give up a 39-yard catch, and it's 39 yards. He's catching it, and you're tackling him right there. You're yeah. ready to stop it. It's another thing when the 40-yard play becomes an 80-yard play. Yeah, agree. We haven't seen that. We saw it a little bit in the Maryland game, but we haven't really seen this defense I agree with you on that. that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good so point. So I think that was kind of disappointing to see them go back to that where – Giving uh, up those chunk yardage, yeah. explosive – like to, for touchdowns. Yes. Like you said against mm-hmm. – uh, you, you gave that great stat against Maryland. Yeah. That Texas actually won the explosive play margin in that game. But Maryland had more explosive plays that led to touchdowns. There were yeah. actual touchdowns. Or that were, yeah, or that were actual that touchdowns. Actually, I think yeah. it was like four of their explosive plays were like touchdowns. And yes. Texas had one. Explosive scores. Exactly. Much more indicators. Yeah. Well, you success. cash in on yeah. that, too. Exactly. Two outs away right now are the Astros. Oh, All go. right, let's go, go ahead. And, let's go ahead and move on to uh, Texas OU week. As we, you guys got anything residual you want to mention on K State? Because I think um, we're gonna have some stuff that crosses special over. Special teams? Should we get special teams some discussion uh, with yeah. the Josh Rodin the kicker stuff? Yeah, I know. I mean, well, I don't let's want to talk be about negative. that because that's gonna practice. that's gonna bleed into uh, to our okay. OU discussion. Yeah, this offense, as good as Tim Beck was calling the game between the twenties, I thought he called a great game. And you mentioned the running back situation compounds it's a ride. tough, man, the red zone. And the offensive line situation does, too. This offense is awful executing in the red zone. Just <laughs> awful. Yeah. Like, they don't have their red zone identity. I don't know if they're going to find one this year because you don't yet have that dynamic guy at tight end that you can put on the field. Nope. Yeah. You, you, even though the running back issue is what it is, you would think – Chris Warren can again He'd go back to the USC conversation. Zone, right? yeah. You would think first and goal from the three, a couple cracks he can get you 250, close. Two fifty. Yeah. The issue I had, I thought it was it's indefensible to have. Let me go back to that first that drive where they missed the field goal where Tom Herman. Oh, they wanted to begin the game. Down. Yeah, let me look at. It. And okay. Tom Herman today has basically stated he hates. He said it straight yeah, up. He, he said I hate twenty yard field goals. The quote goals. that mm-hmm. stood out to me, uh, and I think it was, I think it was Ed Clements who had the follow up. He said, "You do realize you're aggravating a lot of people when you choose not to take he said, the points." He yeah. said, "His Tom Herman's exact quote was, I don't care.' I'll give it. Yeah, yeah I don't He's care. Like, I don't stupid. care. He you does don't not get, care. 
He was like, yeah, when you look at the wing and we'll So, I mean, boo him all you want because he doesn't care. He said, he said the metrics tell him, way. yeah, every and time to take the take. Seven points. when you, I mean, literally, that's two and a third field goals that you're going to be no, conceding it makes because sense, of the but you Mathematically, got, it does. You got first and goal from the three, and in that four-play sequence, you did not have Chris Warren or Colin Johnson on the field. Your, mo- your best perimeter playmaker and you, who should be your best short yardage runner. Rod, to me, that's indefensible. It is. I agree. And we saw this, I think we saw it versus Maryland, actually. Remember? Yeah. They, in the red zone, they didn't have Colin Johnson in the game. It's like, it was, yeah. Why would you not have the 6'6 six, six wide receiver, even as a decoy, yeah. to mm-hmm. freak out the defense out there? You know, they were motioning Chris Warren out of the backfield to like five wides. I'm with you on that one. I can understand that play calling, um, like schematic issues, like him trying to get in the groove of play calling. And I understand red zone. We talked about it, offensive line and no dynamic presence in the running uh, in the running back position. That's going to hurt your ability to be able to cash in the red zone. But not putting your best. And you know what? The Chris Warren thing, I'm going to give him a pass on that because they don't like Chris Warren as much as I like Chris Warren, and I'm, I'm starting to come to grips with that, and that's cool. But Colin Johnson? Even the coach said Colin Johnson should get the ball more. Like, he's working yeah. on That's his pro- pet project, he said last week, to get Colin Johnson the ball more. For him not to be on the field – in the red zone, in any situation in the red zone, 6'6", a guy who I think Matt Miller, a bleach reporter, was like their NFL draft scout, he said, I got him as my number one wide receiver in 2019 right now. Like, that, it's a bold no matter statement. if you're Jimbo, it is a bold he's statement. blocking on the outside. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with it. My point is, that guy needs to be on the field in the red zone. That's Like you said, indefensible. I don't know who to blame Kyle for that. Porter did have a touchdown that was overturned, and his knee clearly was down. But to me – if Chris Warren's not your best red zone, short yardage, goal line runner, it's Obviously it's not, not Kyle Porter, clearly. Maybe it's Tony O'Connor. Maybe it's Danny Young. I don't know, Maybe but Young, find yeah. somebody that can yeah. push the pile for two or three yards. It's inexcusable at the University of Texas for you to have an offense. You've got first and goal at the three, and you can't come away with points. Yeah. Now nah, I'm with you on that one. That, that, that was frustrating. And I actually wanted him to kick the field goal there, too. So I'm thinking about the identity of the team, how they're going to need points. But, but you're, th- you're thinking about it, too. You're facing a Bill Snyder coach team. You all, you take the points. I know, too. That's kind of what I was thinking. I was like, this, we thought it was going to be a right. low-scoring game, too. Yeah. I think we all in thought his, it was going to be. That's why, in his mind, I think he went for it because yeah. he's so close to getting seven when it's so hard to get seven that he well, is. He was like, I just think that I can see that argument mathematically. I think Sam Ellinger, not kind of, I think Sam Ellinger bailed him out because the offense is just that much more explosive with Sam in there. So you end up being able to get points and generate points. But based on the offense that we had seen prior to that the last couple of games, I, I was all about taking the points. But I understand the math. The math makes perfect sense to me. Like, it yeah. does. That's I just, why it's well, funny, though, when I hear members of the media that, like, they, they just laugh that he has, like, this book of analytics that's, like, thinking oh, it's yeah. a joke that it's being decided upon these things. And, like, it's a running joke amongst a lot of people covering Texas or even te- among Texas fans. It's like, that info in there is a lot of information that's only probably going to help you in the long term. But if you want to ignore it, ignore I, it. I don't have a problem with the decisions to go for, Rod. My problem continues to be if you're going to do that, if that's have your – Have you ready. Have a plan. Yeah. Have a plan and personnel ready. Like, under, yeah, exactly. Totally. I'm with you. It seems like they do that, and it's like, well, since you go for it on fourth down so much, you think you'd have a separate book of plays all together, literally just for fourth down situations and red zones. You know what I mean? Like – that's what I would think, but it, it, I'm with you. It seems like no, that is not the case. Like they don't. Like I know, I know. <laughs> Tom talked about after the SC game that the touchdown in overtime to Kay Brewer, the throwback pass. Well, that yeah. was our two point play. All right, you can have more than one two point play, <laughs> more than one short yardage <laughs> yeah. play. It's exactly. fine. <laughs> He's got like, one. He's just got one. That's, that's it. it. All right, we, we got so one. Well. We're saving this one for the fourth quarter, coach. Yeah, I don't. I'm with you on that one. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. Yeah, yeah. So, but but, but maybe Rod, it's the kick. Maybe it's the confidence in the kick. And, and the Josh maybe Rowland the, thing, like I, I credited Tom Herman for going out and finding him a JUCO kicker because Charlie had left him with no options mm-hmm. in that department. But at this point, I I know he talked about when well, he's fifteen to fifteen in practice. You know, yesterday, like yeah, yeah. like that's kind of that old thing. Like yeah, in my head when I'm talking to women before I get to the <laughs> club, I'm really good. Right, but yeah. for some reason, when I'm face to face with her, that that pickup line doesn't come out as smooth. That's exactly. It's like, like in practice, it seems I give, to be a, the give a damn problem. what he's doing in practice. Well, especially as a kicker, as a kicker, it's all mental. Like it's like a golfer. You're all in, you're in your or, own head. Or a closer in baseball, man. Once yeah. you once you get the yips, it's you don't get rid of that that easy. No, know? I'm with you on that one. But it, 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 that's one of those situations where I I think he did everything. He exhausted every possibility to improve the kicker position. They just are screwed in SOL yeah. right now. To kick. 
Exactly. Yeah, that's the one thing you really can't quantify when recruiting a kicker is his head going to work whenever there's 100,000 people. Exactly. Going forward, as we go to the OU game, I like that we talked about the field goal situation and situational execution. And, Rod, I actually want to go back to uh, – remember we talked about third downs at Iowa State and how awful the third down, yeah. the third and distance to go. Um, and I talked about, like, the third downs Texas missed. So Texas ended up being 8 of 15 on third downs – uh, against K State, would you like to know the down distances that yeah, Texas that converted like that. on? Yeah. How about and you remember how it was all like third and like seven or longer against Iowa mm-hmm. State? How about this time? These Texas converted the following third downs: third and seven, third and two, third and three, third and goal, third and one, third and ten, third and four, third and goal. Pretty. Yeah, it's pretty good. That's way better than I thought it was going to be. Actually, so yeah. they only had two. Two, two third and mediums or third and long. Yeah, the third, third and short. seven that you converted, that was Ellinger, Ellinger to Humphrey for 21 yards in the first quarter. And then you had a third and ten that was the, hump, the Ellinger to Humphrey pass that he fumbled that Warren Oh, recovered. that he recovered, yeah. yeah. That was a clutch recovery, too. <laughs> yeah, Chris Man. Warren. He actually did have a, a good game. Chris right, Warren considering he didn't run the ball credit well, for doing the, Hold on. Astros, Astros win. Woo! Five, four, moving on. That was my random Ghost Rose assistant. Yes. Nice. Um, yes. I'm so glad they're going to the ALCS. All right. Anyway, uh, Chris ACS. Warren deserves a lot of credit, though, because even though he's not touching the rock, he had he had a, this was his best game, Rod, maybe as a blocker. Right? There was a couple no times doubt. where he got out as the lead blocker on yeah. a couple flips or sweeps to Reggie Hemphill. I agree with that. Where he got out and threw some hellacious blocks, and then you talk about the fumble recovery. Uh, that shows that that's a guy that's still locked in, even though he's not – Getting his touches, mm-hmm. he's still buying into the team That's concept. Point. That's good to Which see. Which is from maybe Chris why he's Moore. playing more, and at least right. that the coaches know he's buying in. Yeah. Here's the, here's the issue, Rob. When you talk about third downs, you talk about red zone, you talk about special teams. The OU game, as we know, is a game that when you fail to convert on those areas in this game, those momentum swings, they will kill you in this game. Everything's magnified. Everything's magnified, man. It's just it's one of those environments where. The, 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 kind of the culture of the game, that turnover is ten times bigger in this game. And it's not only because the, the environment actually, it, it feels magnified because the stadium is split right. in half. Like, it, yeah, there's always somebody yelling and screaming. But, you know, the you know the big plays, the momentum shifts are seismic in this game. And they just say oh, just, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it, literally, it it's palpable. You can feel the momentum shifting back. And there have been games where I, I've talked to Lohan fans and they go, Man, I felt that momentum shifting on this play or that play. And they're totally right. Like you can almost feel it when it happens, a big sack here or something there, and you can feel the momentum shifting. That's why this game comes down to you need playmakers, dog, because those are the people that are gonna snatch the snatch the momentum back in this game. Because you can't let one team have it for too long. That's how blowouts happen. Trust me. They right. Oklahoma did it in two thousand, they snatched the momentum and we I don't ever remember us making one play to take it back. The avalanche. It it was it became quicksand, man. The downward spiral, and we've seen it happen before with yeah. Mac, uh, you know, Mac Brown coach teams. So I I I'd be weary of that. The the you know the downward spiral, the quicksand that could happen in this game if you don't snatch the momentum back. And it's a it's a it's a prize fight, man. It's a heavyweight fight. So you're going back and forth. Uh-huh. You're gonna get hit in the mouth. Like right. it, it's gonna happen. It's Oklahoma. It ain't. Tulane, you know what I mean? I could play against Tulane and never get hit in the mouth, you know what I mean? Play against Iowa State and never get hit in the mouth. Not lately. Uh, Matt Campbell's Iowa State Cyclones will hit you in the mouth. Yes. But my point being, Oklahoma, you get hit in the mouth and you punch and then you get hit in the mouth again. That's how it, it goes like a heavyweight fight. And whoever can take the abuse, can take the hit and bounce back, that's who wins the game. Which is why I, I like Texas' chances in this game. I don't know if yeah, I'm going to pick Texas, but I like Texas' chances in this game. Because go back to that SC game. Yeah, I don't exactly think I don't was. think USC was ready for Texas to hit them in the mouth. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. And they responded. And it was one of those deals yeah. like, oh wow, okay. And that's the point. It seemed like the last few Texas teams, that. the last five years, at times when Texas had beaten Oklahoma, some of those times it was as if the Oklahoma team was like, oh right. wow, got hit in the mouth. That thirteen eight fifteen. True that. And two thousand fifteen. Yeah, I agree and thirteen. That. And Texas yeah. coming into this game having played K State. You've already played one big boy football game now, so the fact that you're going to have to do that again, it's not going to be a shock to anybody. It does. It helps. And, Matt, to your point, and I'm glad you brought that up, that's one of my themes for the week. Rod, we typically talk about young Texas teams or young Oklahoma teams are the ones that are ripe to get blown out in this game. Mm -hmm. But you can say what you want about Charlie Strong, right? And Charlie certainly had his faults while he was the head coach of Texas. The one thing you can credit him for is he got his teams ready to play in this game. He did. 
Yeah. And he basically played Bob Stoops to a draw pretty much the whole time he was here. Yeah, I agree with that. Five, uh, it was a five-point loss his first year. Yeah. A seven-point win second year and a five-point loss last and you're year. You're talking about against teams that the Wait, tech, 17, 13-point underdogs. Yeah, like obviously much less talent. And much less talented teams. I'll, I'll say it. Yeah, those on those Texas teams. So I don't think that you know Rod during your day it was always that that meant Texas a mental block against Oklahoma. You can't mm-hmm. get over that mental block. I don't yep. think that exists with this Texas team at all. That's I, that's I a think good point. I you know talking to. Uh, Talking to Malik Jefferson and some of those guys after the game, I think they 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 look forward to this game. Because they've they, had great, they, they ironic, like you pointed out, they've had very little success. All right, in their in their three or four years here, guys like Malik Jefferson, but against Oklahoma, they've disproportionately and ironically have actually played some of their better games against Oklahoma in that yeah. environment. It's weird. I agree with you. I don't, I don't get it either. But you got to give props to Charlie Strong for it. And too. we even heard T- Herman say today, just sort of, you know, I-, I understand and respect the rivalry, but we're treating it just as another game that, you know, he was a part of different staffs that have been a part of this game, but he wants to make sure that they are treating it as if it's any other one. So you do not put it on that pedestal to where you affect it differently. Now, it's a different viewpoint, way different people view different things, but it's sometimes how the ignorance is bliss. If you don't even know what to fear, don't fear it. And then sometimes that's when the ball hits you in the hands in the Shaq Fu story that we hear from Kwame Cavill yeah. and like it, you crap the bed and yeah. it goes real bad. Or you somehow beat a team that you're 17-point underdog from because you had the that almost false enthusiasm that Kwame Cavill would talk yeah. about that you that's go out false there. False sense of confidence. Irrational, irrational confidence. Irrational. Now, if yeah. it works off, it can really benefit it. But you also could go to crap if it doesn't work. Too, now, I remember so. Mike Finger always said that about uh, Case McCoy. He that, uh, Case McCoy has this irrational confidence that at every every now and then it, a, just, it comes to fruition. A gunslinger like, not hell? in not <laughs> yeah. a gunslinger's body. Exactly. It's um, like Brett Favre mentality. But, Uncle Rico arm. The, yeah, right. <laughs> but get it back to the, the, the Texas game. One thing I am concerned about is, and you brought this up before, uh, Jeff, and you uh, a few years ago, actually when Texas starts going through different offensive coordinators, I think you've brought it up a couple of times, whether it be Major Applewhite or Sterling Gilbert or Sean Watson. Coaching – Calling plays in this game is different too. Mm-hmm. Remember, it, it's a, it's a, I, you know what I mean. So I do wonder if Tim Beck kind of understands the. And he's got Tom Herman there with him, which helps. And a lot of these guys on this staff have actually been a part of this rivalry in some way, form or fashion. That's good too. But it is different in play. That's why we always like the major called. You know that major, like when major would call the uh, call a text, like you're like, yeah, I, I, I think major. 2013 because major understood. He understands what it is about. Yeah. It was like, look. <clears throat> you to win this game, you've got to win the line of scrimmage. So we're yeah. going to lean on a veteran offensive line. And at the time, we thought Jonathan Gray Hold was on the Hold on, in 2015, who's OC? Jay Norvell? Jay Norvell. Uh, Jay Norvell had Robert. been in this game. game. Like, like, it's something about un- – uh, you brought this up uh, like years ago, so I, I'm not going to take your point. But I agree with your point you made years ago, even when you were making it about Jay Norvell a major. I wonder if he understands, how, you know, how the the rhythm of, the rhythm of this rivalry and how it goes. I, back yeah, and forth, I get that. From, I, mean? I got that from Will Muschamp because Muschamp's first year. Yeah, they. I mean, granted, go back and look at the guys Oklahoma had on the office with Sam Bradford and oh, that was De- nat- Demarco yeah. Murray and Jermaine Gresham and yeah, Manny Johnson and uh, I think it was uh, Joaquin Iglesias outside of yeah, wide receiver. They he had NFL guys on that roster, yeah. but Muschamp said the next year that. His and I'm paraphrasing here, our spirit animal here on the Blitz. <laughs> His quote was, "You know, I didn't know what calling plays in that game was all about because it's different." Mm-hmm. And the next year, he was much more prepared. Yeah, for that game, and the following year, even the, two, the 2010 game, yeah, called a really good game defensively, and so. And Brian Harson was one of those coaches that never really figured it out. Like, oh, we want to do. Good point. There was too much funk when this is a game where that's a great look, point. you can have funk, but at some you point you got to line up and smash somebody in the mouth. And if you can't do exactly that, right. it's going to be a long day. And I think all the, all those things have to be taken into you know taken into account when you're calling plays. You got to understand it is a heavyweight fight going back and forth. You got to deliver a, a haymaker every now and then. You got to snatch the momentum with plays. I think all those things play a role. So I, I think it's going to be a challenge for Tim Beck. I really do because it's. And I wonder if he'll rise to the challenge. You know, what I, mean? I do think there was something. You know, Sean Watson actually, I thought, at t- called a de- called a he called a good game in, in 2014. I'll give him that. Uh, well, clock, he, he, he also knows a little bit about the rivalry from yeah. being around it at least. You know clock I mean? m- clock management was a huge issue at the end of that game, obviously, yeah, just with the timeouts and burning timeouts and yeah. just not being careful with it. But um, I think the one thing that helped Charlie's staff in that game was. That we talk about Charlie, you know, them having a tough time adapting to the conference. 
for Charlie, the OU game is the closest thing to an SEC game the Big 12 has. Yep. Yeah, I agree In that. terms of it is a line of scrimmage game. It yep. is a man's game. Agreed. You got you got, you got to be ready to be a grown man if you're going to walk in that Cotton Bowl and play that game. So I think from that standpoint, Charlie's staff kind of knew what they were getting into. They were, they were ready for that game. And I think Tom Herman's staff, the fact that Tom Herman's been in this game, the fact that Oscar Giles has been in this game, you've got some guys on the staff that have been around this game. Um, I'd like to think that they're going to be prepared, Rod, but the point that I was going to make earlier, because Matt brought it up, talking about the blowouts, and I said, you know, young Texas teams are right for blowouts. I think the fact that these players have been in this game and been around it and had success in it, to me, there's no excuse for Texas to take a huge loss in this game. Yeah, you don't want that what we call those coyote ugly losses. Right. You know what I mean? Where they lose, they get twenty one and off the stick. That's what, I, and I think Tom Herman understands that. You know, you you can't. We, we're done with those days in Texas football of getting like just embarrassed and on a big stage. So I think they'll be ready to play. There are just some concerns about, like you said, it's a line of scrimmage league in Texas. You know, even though the offensive line played really well versus K State, right? You know, you're missing your top four offensive linemen. So yeah. you know, you got to build on that. So it's really it's it's interesting though because you look at the ma- the matchup to me that's exciting is the Texas defense against the Oklahoma offense. Baker Mayfield versus the Texas defense. Is yeah, what it comes down to Lake you know Travis the deal. Versus West Who's Lake. already talking trash? By the yeah. way, he said that Sam Mellinger has never. He said he said basically said Sam Mellinger is from Westlake. And Westlake it. hadn't he, – he's never beaten Lake Travis or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's a Lake Travis-Westlake. It's, it's so great. funny that it's, it's Texas a, OU, but it's Lake rivalry Travis The rivalry within the rivalry, right? That'd it's be hilarious. Great. Malik Jefferson really got Red River Week kicked off after the uh, K-State game when he was being asked about the OU game and so he heard about Iowa State planting the flag in, uh, in Norman on Saturday. And he was asked if he would ever plant a flag. And this was Malik's response. Um, I was there when he gave his quote. <laughs> uh, his response, no, no, no. I respect any opponent we play. I don't think it gets that crucial where you have to plant a flag on somebody's field. I think that's just ignorance. <laughs> I don't understand why people would do that because it comes back on you, obviously. <laughs> uh, see, I like, there's some good undertones with that I will one. say that's this. A sophisticated I, a, a trash talk war, in my opinion. It favors Baker Mayfield because his his, his X Men ability is kind of his his transcendent douche d bag douchey quality. Like he's so douchey that it like it's like Jason Kelsey kind of you know Travis Kelsey kind of yeah. douchey. Like it transcends almost like how Johnny Manziel used to. He would he can almost lift his play to a different level to a rarefied air almost through d bag d bag abilities. So it, it where's players where's, like that. Where's, yeah. where's douchiness on Gruden's quarterback chart? Where would he what what number? Uh, would he I'm find sure out? there's a there's a certain element to it. But you you get what I'm saying? Like he's the a, cockiness is, is an I, element there. Uh, yeah, and I think that fa- he likes to talk himself into he kind of mm-hmm. s- smack talks. So remember against Baylor, he's talking before yeah. about how he's their daddy and stuff. That fan, there's a story about him and the fans at Oklahoma Ohio State game. Remember he gets into it with the fans. Right. He's like a WWE star when at times he can talk himself into getting really rowdy because he plays with emotion, almost like yeah. a defensive guy. Sam Ellinger does it too, but he doesn't talk trash. Right. Like that. Um. So really, you're looking at the Texas offense against the Oklahoma defense, and Oklahoma's been a hot mess defensively. Yeah, they have the been. last few weeks. Mm-hmm. So. And they don't really know what Texas is going to bring to the table. His right. offense is still come improving. You know? We're we're really going to get into this matchup. Uh, you know, I'll get into it on the site. Rod, I know you'll do it on the Rodcast. Mm-hmm. By the way, one to three for the Rodcast on one hundred four nine The Horn AM twelve sixty and uh, the Horn FM app. Um, but guys, do you have any just early thoughts on this game? Because I know it's early in the week, but I I mean I think I think as much of a mess as Oklahoma has been defensively, and it goes back to. The stoops that that cover two defense that they play that they haven't yeah. changed. History has shown you can attack them vertically if you've got the studs on the perimeter mm-hmm. to do it. Baylor did, Iowa State did, yep. and Texas does. That's why I think Texas has a chance to move the ball and have some success in this game. Uh, I, I agree with you. I think they, I think they have. Listen, the Ellinger offense with him at the helm is a different offense than Shane Bouchard. So I think they will be a little bit more explosive in the game. My concern is really that basically Oklahoma. They are not overconfident anymore. That that overconfidence factor that you had uh, prior to this, once Iowa State beats Oklahoma, mm-hmm. then now they're ashamed. Now they're embarrassed. Refocus. Yeah, now they're refocused. Now they're re-energized. Now you know they're they're playing pissed off. So you get you get a refocused, re-energized Oklahoma team. As you know, if Iowa State doesn't pull that upset, hell, you probably get you probably get that Iowa, that that product or that result right. that Iowa State got. And then maybe Oklahoma was looking past Iowa State and looking for the Texas game. Mm-hmm. Could be the reason too. Either way, 
I think you get a good showing from Texas. I don't think they win. I don't think okay. they're going to win the game. But I all think you get a good showing from Texas. All right, so we're ready to do picks. Matt, how did we all come out last week? I actually week? didn't tabulate up that fine. We were only one game off last week, but I'll get that tabulated up. Uh, the sheets at the house. We were 12 and 8, 9 and 7, and 7 and 8 and 12 was the other one. So we're still a handful of games apart from one another. But going to the first game, Texas Tech, West Virginia, who you got? Where is oh. this game being played? West Virginia. In Morgantown? Yep. Mm. I will go with West Virginia, but that's going to be a tight game. And Texas yeah. Tech, in this in this conference, the way the conference is, Texas Tech can compete. Or at least they can spoil Tech's playing plans. Be better fun. defense. It is getting um, better, yeah. You know what? I'll, I'll take West Virginia in a close game. What's the line on that, man? You got Three the line point on that? favorite. What? Oh, so Vegas basically thinks it's a, in a neutral location. It'd be a toss up, right? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'll take I'll take West Virginia. Yeah, I'm taking West Virginia too. Okay. All right, next game, moving on. Look at Auburn and LSU. Who you got? Auburn, give me Auburn. Auburn at LSU winning. Yeah, Auburn. We're all on the same yeah, page that's there. Too easy. Staying in the SEC, A and M at Florida. Ooh. A&M at Florida. Aggies yeah. playing better too. Played Alabama tough. Florida's got all kinds of issues. You know they're right confident. Now. Is it at Florida? Uh, yes, sir. Ooh, it's in man. the swamp. Uh, might, oh man, I might take the. I might. Well, I might take these Aggies. That's crazy. I feel that way. But. You know what? It, it, whether I go with the Aggies or go against them, I'm always wrong. Like I'm. I'm. <laughs> I'm never more wrong on anybody than I am with A and M. So I guess. You know what? Screw it. Give me the Aggies. There you Going go. down to Gainesville and getting a win. I'm taking Florida. Staying away from the Aggies. Uh, I'll let Jeff be able to make up some ground on it, so I'll take Florida. Even though I want to take the Aggies here. That's nice charitable. Don't I don't trust Florida right now. I don't. All right, last yeah, one's going to be. I like Jim McElwain. Yeah, look, he's funny. He's always on that shark. UCLA <laughs> versus Arizona. Who you got? UCLA and Arizona. Good Lord, Matt. You couldn't find us a better game for the for Oh, the last man, this game. is one of the best ones. It's the closest one, a mm. one-point line. Uh, we can change it, though. No. How about this one? Let's go with this one instead. Florida State, Duke, who you got? No, I'd, 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 I'd rather. I'm Dude, not. Duke Duke would probably beat Florida. Florida State's terrible. Yeah, Florida State's Florida not State, very good. Florida State, six-and-a-half-point favorite. Um, okay, are they at home? Nope, okay, well, so which one are we picking? Which one, are we, which, like you which, one? which one do you want to go with? All right, let's go with that one. Uh, Florida State, Duke? Yes, sir. Taking Duke. Where is this game being played? <laughs> Is this game in Durham? I'll take Duke. Yeah. I'll take Duke for the hell of it. I'm telling you, Florida State's been so bad that I see them. I don't. I don't know why they're so bad. Their offensive line is atrocious. You know what? Uh, give me Florida State. All right, I will take Florida State. James Blackman well. got better towards the end of that Miami game. Yeah, yeah. you're right. This is true. This and is and look at Florida. Look at Florida State's three losses. NC State's ranked in the top 25 now. Mm-hmm. Miami's a top 10 team, and Alabama. Good point. So I'll take Florida week. State. That'll be Rod taking Duke and Jeff taking A and M. About the only differences we got. But now moving on, Texas versus A or versus Oklahoma. What's your pick? Oh gosh, you know, kind of with Rod, I I, I think it's a good showing. Uh, a good showing. Not enough though to win. Uh, what's the line on this, Matt? I think it's seven and a half yeah, last down I saw. Yeah, six and a half, I believe. Yeah, it started at seven and a half, I think. Though. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I'll take Tex. I'll take Texas to cover. Um, I'll take Texas. Let's go 31-27, Oklahoma. Ooh. Good game. Um, I think it's a close game. Yeah, I, I have faith. I have faith in these players in this game and uh, and in that Todd Orlando defense to, to keep it close enough. I do think – I'm not going to be shocked. Here's the thing to keep in mind about Sam Ellinger, and we talked about teams having tape on him. Sam's a gunslinger, mm-hmm. and he's going to be a guy that you want the ball in his hands with three minutes left and 80 yards to go. Yep. He's also the type of quarterback that's, you know, that far of Roethlisberger thing where he's going to make a play or two throughout the course of a game that you go, what, what the heck the was he thinking? Was yeah, he's a freshman too. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I'm, I'm with, I think Todd Orlando is the reason Texas stays in the game. I think Todd, I'm glad you get a bounce back game from Todd Orlando. Usually, you know, I mean, after that Maryland game, they, that defense came back bigger, better, stronger, faster. I think you'll get a bounce back game from that defense in this Texas OU game. It's an emotional game. Defense plays with emotion. Um, I'm going to say Texas loses the game, but they keep it tight for like three and a half quarters. Maybe OU pulls away 30, 
OU wins 36 to 27. Ooh, you're really close to me. I actually was sitting there trying <laughs> to figure out how it plays out, and I think about similar to you that it's going to be close, but OU will prevail by the end of it. And the number that popped in my head was 35-24, and yeah. then I started to think, isn't that the number that on the Rod's pick six was yes. a 35-24 loss, which yes. Texas oh. had a lead early. So I sort of got a feeling it might be similar to that one. So if Holt, you're telling me if Holton Hill, a, uh, six, a Lamar alum, if he, if, he has a, if he has a pick six to put Texas up 14-3, that we should all prepare. Uh, trouble. <laughs> it might be a bad omen. That would be odd. I'll take it. I, I, I will be on the side of pick sixes as victorious. All yeah. right. Matt, thanks for everything, man. Yeah, you are more than welcome. Rod B., appreciate the time and the knowledge. Love it, brother. For Matt, for Rod, for Travis, the best damn videographer in the podcast game. For everybody. At 104.9 The Horn, the Austin Radio Network, that we are proud to be a part of this family. And you can get this podcast that we record here every week on SoundCloud, iTunes, any podcast app. Isn't that right, Matt? Yes, sir. Just type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Horn family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I'm Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.